there was definitely a moment where I was feeling frustrated with going about things the normal way. I wanted to explore using synthesizers in music, but I just couldn't get myself, you know, I like techno. I like a lot of electronic bass music that, you know, people would consider normal electronic music. I enjoy listening to it, but when I tried to kind of emulate it, it's just like I couldn't do it. And uh, so I just decided to dis distort everything. And uh, yeah, I mean, I just, you know, I started listening to uh, different harsh noise artists, I guess. Uh, and it just kind of, it it was almost like cathartic because that's how I was feeling and I was hearing it in this audio. I don't know if people would call it music, but I do, you know. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, I play it for, you know, my wife or anyone, you know, and, and they're like, oh, how can you listen to this, you know? <laughs> I had like a bunch of Caven posters hung up. And I was like, man, it just looks like I'm glorifying myself, you know? It's like, oh, I got to hang some different shit up. <laughs> like this? You mean like this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like I've weird, got you know? fan art on the walls that people yeah. have sent me. And I'm just like, I, I'm not trying to show off. I just want to... Yeah, right. I want to just showcase what they've done because, like, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Yeah, totally. You know? I know. I like, I like the one over, I guess, I don't know. It's weird. It's all reversed. Yeah, yeah. They, they look cool. The face, I guess I didn't uh, realize at first that it was you. <laughs> yeah, Wizard Wizard Cleave did the did this one. Uh, yeah, from New York. That's the one that I was just talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Have you have you got? Are, where are you stationed right now? Boston. A station uh, like I'm you're in at Salem, war. Mass. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Salem. Salem, Mass, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Cool, Mass. All right. So yeah, this dude's from New York. I mean, this dude. The mm -hmm. other one's from Puerto Rico. I think. I thought yeah, maybe yeah. you were in New York. I know you guys are all up there in the Northeast. Yep. Area. Um, yeah, we're all now back in New England. Steve was in New York for a little while, but you know, mm. he moved back home. Back home. Yeah. All right. Well, let me give you a proper intro so people that are already. Wa I'm going to leave most of this in. Who cares? Uh, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> but for those that are watching and listening. Welcome to the RRBG podcast. Welcome back, Mr. J.R. Connors of Caven. And uh, hold on, I have the name right here. Marilith. Did I say that it's, right? So it's Marilith. Marilith. Okay, my yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah. But it's funny because I keep referring to it as Marilith. I think it's I, the I, eye that's throwing us off. Yeah. And I also think it's because people are kind of used to seeing the MAR as like kind of like Marilyn Manson or something. You know what uh, I mean? Like it's just, it easily rolls off the tongue like that yeah uh but yeah it's it's uh so it's marilith and it's kind of uh, it goes back like the history of the name is kind of like a mix between the goddesses mara and then lilith oh, okay. uh and they okay. smash them together for like uh it really D D. if you look if you put in marilith on google it just it's a bunch of D D stuff really so you play yeah, D? &D? uh well i grew up playing D &D. Yeah. i don't do it so much these days um I've tried in my adult life to do it, but it's it's uh it's been a little too awkward for me, and it's it's <laughs> always been you know for me and not them, you know that sort of thing. But do you dress up? Uh, no, I that might be what I you're missing. I wanted to secretly, you know. <laughs> that might be what but, you're missing. Uh, you might just have to go all in, you know. Yeah, maybe, maybe <laughs> I just gotta go total LARP, huh? Yeah, fuck <laughs> it. Who cares? Who's who cares? Who cares? Who's yeah. watching? I mean, look, this dude. Uh, Famous actor, model guy, Manganiello. Is that his name? Joe Manganiello? The big guy. Uh, he's Deathstroke and I mean, Batman. He's, he's openly oh, yeah, yeah. Dungeons and Dragony with all of Hollywood. Yeah. He, he I mean, they, they have like a, a little crew out there now, right? It's like, yeah. uh, like Vin Diesel and all those guys, you know? I mean, I, um, uh, ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's definitely a little silly. I mean, it's like, you know, but... I can't talk shit about it, you know, what anyone likes, you know. Oh, no, God I'm not knows talking I, shit. I like some weird shit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all do. I think we all yeah. I mean, especially anybody that's watching this show knows that I'm into some weird shit. I play a lot of yeah. video games I shouldn't be playing. Oh, uh, me but, too, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll get into that for sure. I, right. want to, I do want to talk a little bit about Marlith because I heard, uh, heard it yesterday on Bandcamp. Mm -hmm. It's out. Like, yeah. It's out, it's out, out. I thought it was it's coming. Out. It's out. <laughs> yeah, no, it uh so I released it uh last Friday. Nice. So no, but today's Monday, so two Fridays ago. 
<laughs> okay, two Fridays ago. Yeah. I just saw the post. On, it was like the the static the artwork the, that looks like sound waves. What is that? What yeah, that is? It's basically it's just the uh, you know sp- from a spectrograph. A spectrograph. And it's been black and white, and you know. Yeah, I saw that post. I'm like, what's this? And I checked it out, and man, it's it's dope. It's heavy. Cool, man. It's electronic. It's different yeah. than anything we were familiar with, you know, coming from you. So what what made you do that? <laughs> uh, it was really, I mean, I've had a long love for synths, really. Okay. Uh, just for the sound of the synthesizer. Um, and I, like, you know, going back from, you know, growing up, you know, listening to Rush and, you know, Genesis, and they would always have these like really cool, you know, kind of like, really heavy drops of like synth notes and stuff. And it turns out it was like Moogs and, you know, oh, yeah. all those like really beautiful sounding synths. Um, but that's where it kind of comes from. And like the first record that I can think of owning as a child was um, the uh, Axel F uh, song from like the soundtrack there. I, 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 it's, you know, passing me, uh, but um, what the hell is that movie? It's like a, it's a police movie. A I'll have to movie? look it up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Axel F. Ah, oh, man, it's with um... Beverly Hills Cop. Beverly Is Hills Cop. Be- no, that's Axel Foley. Forty-eight hours with uh, Nick Nolte. Yeah, Beverly Hills Cop. Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah, in '84, man. There we go. I had it. <laughs> yeah, you did it. God. Um. Yeah, they have some cool synth music in that one. I, I know they sell like the vinyl soundtrack of that movie somewhere. Yeah, so like, I had, Mondo like, or little... something. It was a little 45 that I had as a kid, you know. Nice. Um, nice. Yeah, old school, right? But but wait, Beverly Hills what what the stuff you hear in Beverly Hills Cop doesn't sound what you're doing like what you're doing though. No, no. I mean that that's just <laughs> yeah. Uh in my twisted mind it is. Um, oh, okay. That's your But no, your I think uh <laughs> that's that's kind of where just the familiarity of of those types of sounds came in, you know. Okay. Um, and making music with synth- synthesizers. It's a hard word to say, synthesizer. Synthesizer, yeah. You know? But uh, no, that that's where it comes from, I think. Uh, but then, of course, like growing up in the 90s, it's like we had like Ministry and Nine Inch Nails and that whole thing. Hell you know? yeah. Um, and I, I would be, you know, fooling myself if they aren't, uh, you know, cited as inspiration, you know, because they, they were definitely ingrained in, you know, my... You know, my my teenage years, anyways. For so. sure, I definitely hear a lot of that ministry sound, a lot of the heavy early nails, yeah, disto- very distorted nails, like broken era. Nails. Yeah, I mean, I I kind of wanted to do so. There's a lot of um, electronic based heavy music, or you know, industrial synth music. I don't know, you know, everyone's got a different term for it, but sure. uh, you know that that stuff is really. I think a lot of people are using the technology in a great way, where they're trying to make it really clear and pristine, but also make these like crazy sounds coming from electronic instruments. Um, but I kind of wanted to like you know, I wanted to make something that sounded a little bit more raw, and uh, definitely like I I can't say that I can make nice, clean, pristine sounding recordings, you know. Um, so I just you know I did it you know kind of four track style, eight track. Uh, you know, it's an electronic recorder that I have. It's all digital, I should say. Okay. Um, but, you know, I approached it in the same way as, you know, how we used to do it with our four track tape machines, you know, uh, just plugging stuff up and getting it to sound as good as I could do it, you know. Um, but yeah, I, you know, and then also uh, a lot of the noisy aspects of it, and a lot of distortion, it was, uh, it was kind of, I was uh, in a way, frustrated with uh doing things in a quote-unquote normal way of where you get into a room with you know a bunch of band members and you write music and it's kind of like really structured and it's kind of become uh like a a little bit too comfortable of a process at this point you know Mm. i mean i still enjoy it don't get me wrong it's some of the best moments of my life is getting in the room you know with the dudes in cave and and you know just being able to hash this stuff out but there was definitely a moment where I was feeling frustrated with going about things the normal way. I wanted to explore using synthesizers in music, um, but I just couldn't get myself, you know, I like techno. I like a lot of electronic bass music that, you know, people would consider normal electronic music, electro, all that stuff. I enjoy listening to it, but when I tried to kind of emulate it, it's just like, I couldn't do it. 
you know? I and I was like, I was getting frustrated at a point um, just because I couldn't figure out what the hell to do with it. And uh, it spurned me into kind of like a weirdly, uh, like almost aggression towards making music, if that makes sense. And uh, so I just decided to dis distort everything. Um, and that's when I kind of really fell, uh, you know, into the rabbit hole of, uh, you know, power electronics and the noise genres that uh, you can come across now, especially on Bandcamp. Bandcamp's got a lot of cool stuff on it. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I just, you know, I started listening to uh, different uh, harsh noise, uh, you know, artists, I guess. Uh, and it just kind of it it was almost like cathartic because that's how it was feeling. And I was hearing it in this audio. I don't know if people would call it music, but I do, you know? Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, I play it for, you know, my wife or anyone, you know, and, and they're like, oh, how can you listen to this? You know, I try but, with, with a lot of it. I've seen a few yeah. of it. Uh, I have friends that do it and, you know, I'll see it live and stuff. Live is a different thing. Cause you're seeing like mm. a performance of it, you know? Yeah, but like at home, I've tried and just, I after like a few minutes, I can't. But like your stuff, it wasn't all like that. There was actual, you know, song structure to a lot of it. Right. Yeah, I th that's what it ended up uh, turning out to be in the end. Mm. I'm still, uh, I still uh, picture and kind of imagine the way Marlith progresses as getting a little bit more experimental. That's mm. how I would like to see it. You know, but uh, at this point, I was getting frustrated again. I, there's a lot of frustration in this project. <laughs> uh, okay. But so I was starting to get frustrated on that end because I was, you know, spending a lot of time messing around with all this gear and stuff and, you know, rehashing some of these like ideas that I just couldn't put into focus. Uh, and then I was just like, you know what, let me just do that thing where you, you know, you write what you know sort of thing. And um, and so I, you know, I came up with a couple of different riff parts and I was just like, I'll just put together a few songs just to kind of, you know, put my foot out there, you know, and, and kind of open the door and kind of force me to have something to work towards, like a goal, you know, because mm. um, otherwise I would have just spun my wheels for who knows how long, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, in, that ends up happening with a lot of artists. You get, you know perfectionists really they they don't know what to do and like they know what they want to do but they can't get it exactly right and then they'll finish it for a day and then come back to it tomorrow and hate everything and delete like half mm -hmm. of it you know like uh but i i think having a little bit of you know song structures like like you said it does open the door to let some people in to be like hey look some weird stuff is about to happen but you know mm -hmm. come on come on in like it'll be fine <laughs> yeah and uh definitely during the writing of, you know, different songs. I mean, it, it's like a two or three year period we're talking where I would, you know, put together a rough sketch of a song and then like I didn't touch it until I was like, oh, I got to put something together as a final product, you know, a product might be a wrong word, but, um, but you know, like a, the end of the, the line and I was like, oh, I, well, I can take this and work on it a little bit more. But that was like a whole two to three year process. And in that time, you know, I was still going on tour still playing shows, seeing other people like, uh, you know, um, we got the opportunity to play um, with uh, Author and Punisher. I was going to say, I got really, some vibes of that from yeah. the music, for sure. Um, so watching, you know, Tristan and Doug do their things up on stage, it was definitely, it was super inspiring. Uh, and it also made me think, I started thinking with, you know, watching them play and then watching other people play after that. I started thinking, well, how can I, you know, what would I want to see happen right now that they're maybe not doing mm -hmm. or something that would, uh, that I would want to take and use as, you know, kind of inspiration for what I do. Um, and it turned into a different couple things. And I saw, and I, I mean, there's vibes of Old Man Gloom because I went to go see Old Man Gloom play, you know, nice. uh, and I didn't have to play the show, which was even better because I was just there to watch the show. And it was really nice because I could really absorb everything instead of having to have half of my mind on trying to play a show, you know? Right. Um, and it was, you know, went further, um, you know, we played a couple of different shows with, you know, a few different artists that would start, you know, using electronics and, and kind of bringing that uh, vibe and that skill set kind of more into the heavy 
music realm that we're in, you know? Um, so I, you know, I just, I started thinking to myself with everything that I saw, you know, how would I, what is the, my favorite thing about what I'm seeing and how can I incorporate it? You know, sure. um, just trying to pull from different sources, you know? So you're um, planning on taking this live? I don't know. So that, that's another <laughs> thing. Like I, playing shows for me is a very uh, nerve wracking event. I'm not really comfortable playing shows. I mean, I can kind of switch my brain into it and do it because it's kind of necessary, especially mm -hmm. when I'm in the room, you know? Sure. Yeah. Um, but it is, it's hard for me. I have really high anxiety and, and that, uh, it, it doesn't help with playing live. Uh, but the, you know, the good thing about, you know, the way I've done things previously is I'm always in the band. I'm always behind a drum set. Right. Um, so it's, it's very much, I have a sort of shield in front of me so I can kind of you're get as comfortable as I can. Yeah, you're, exactly. You're going to be the front man on this one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be so, a lot more anxiety. <laughs> yeah. A lot more. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I told myself, you know, when I was like, all right, I'm going to, you know, come get a group of, of tracks together with the intention of releasing it so other people can hear it. And the one thing that I told myself just to get through that process was I'm not going to play shows, you know, because mm. it was like I, I was spinning, you know, these thoughts kept nagging at me, like, you know, how are you going to do this live? How are you going to pull this off live? Like what you're doing right now, can you recreate it live? And it turned into, you know, one of those uh, nagging doubts and things that kind of held me back from progressing on the project. So I was just like, you know what? I'm not going to play any shows. And I kind of made a deal with myself. Just finish the thing, get it out there, and you don't even have to worry about playing shows. But of course, you know, being a musician who's been in the game for so long, I'm like, fuck, <laughs> now I got to play live, man. Yeah, you, you know? got to. You got to do at least a handful. Do really small yeah. shows. Do like uh, yeah, yeah. really tiny, like cafes or something. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'll visit the local coffee shop. Just to get you going. Get the wheel, like, yeah. You get to get the reps in. I think mm. that's what it is. But yeah. It, it's going to be, a, you know, you, you might have to bring in some friends, you know, to help with some of the things. Yep, I've thought about that. Uh, and that's definitely, so in the last, well, since in the last week or so, really, because the record has been released, now it's like, well, what do I do next? And, of course, the the, you know, playing live has come up. Um, between me and, you know, uh, my friends and everyone keeps asking, are you going to play live? So I'm like, man, all right, I kind of have to figure out something. And one thing that would help me is if I had a friend, like you said, come up. And so I, I've been thinking about one thing that I miss from a lot of electronic based acts, even if they're heavy acts, is a drummer on stage. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. I'm not proficient enough to be able to do the vocals and play drums. And like, there's some dudes that, you know, they can you know, handle it all in their one man band. And I just, I, I don't have the brain power for that, you know? Okay. Um, or at least not yet. Anyways, I guess I could kind of exercise that part of my brain, but I don't know. I'm kind of lazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so I've been thinking about bringing in a, you know, especially a drummer. And because of that, I'm trying to think of how to go about doing that. But then there's technical aspects of, you know, a big part of the moralist sound and, what I really enjoy about doing it is that the drums are very distorted. Mm. Um, and pulling that off live without samples and like with someone behind a real kit, I can't really wrap my head around just yet. You know, I think yeah. I have to, you know, kind of reach out and talk to a couple of sound engineers that I know and see, get I their mean, thoughts. You, know? you can go with an electronic drum set. I mean, that's why I've seen certain like industrial acts like VMV nation or something like that. I'll, I'll see yeah. them. They have dudes up there with, like a rack setup that it's all mm. electronic and they're just doing it standing up at that point. They're not even, yeah. Yeah. yeah not I mean, so it. I've thought about that, but it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. For me, I think just because of my background, it's, I always, if I'm going to see a drummer on stage, I, I would like to see them play drums, like mm. a real acoustic drum set, you know? And what I like about watching other drummers play is just how dynamic and, and free that it can be and a lot of uh you know trigger drum sounds you can it's it doesn't feel right i don't know um so i think you know i've been thinking about maybe blending the two like having someone up there with a real drum set but being able to put triggers on the drums so then i could you know kind of blend the sounds in together but 
you know, that I haven't worked into that so much. So I don't really know all the information for it, you know. Got um, it. You can go the very crazy experimental route and start creating new drum pieces. Like yeah, yeah. A trash can, you know, with some weird wrapped, you know, shirt on it or something. Yeah. Just create your own <laughs> ridiculous uh, drum yeah. set. Yeah. I mean, I, I should hit up uh, Tristan from uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. From Author and Punisher. Have <laughs> yeah. Build me some shit. That uh, dude's a madman. I, I can't believe like yeah. the things that he I, that he makes. To uh, he last time I spoke to him, he said he was trying to figure out a way to to make make them so he can sell them to people. Yeah. So when we were on tour, he was working with another guy, um, and I forget the. Uh, I wish I could remember the name of the company that they started or that he's in. Um, you know, working with, but yeah, they're they're trying to get controllers out there. Um, you know, it, it, with that industrial feel that he's got going, you know, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Uh, so I, I've been thinking about that, but, uh, you know, I think about a lot of things, but it takes me a while, you know? So uh, how, how about vinyl? I'm sure that's something you've thought about vinyl for mm. the release. Yeah. The, the thing is, this whole thing is very much, uh, trying to keep costs low. Uh, it do things as much as possible on my own. Cause I don't really, that's always been kind of, uh, someone else's area of expertise in my, my life, you know? Um, and I just kind of wanted to get kind of a better feel for what it takes to put things out and to finish recordings on your own and do that whole thing, do the whole process. Um, and it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. Uh, the, the best option might be getting like, um, you know, like I, I with the podcast, I, I get a lot of emails from PR folks that work with labels that, you know, they handle most of like getting all that stuff together for you. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, I want to put this out on vinyl and all you have to really do is pick like the variant. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, hey, I want it to look like this. And they're like, OK, cool. yeah. Yeah, I, I got a so I worked with uh, Death Wish to um, get the stuff streaming anyway. Okay. Um, I put it all on Bandcamp on my own, but I mean, that's not super difficult, but I was able to manage that. And then, uh, yeah, I had, uh, you know, death wish, uh, you know, they helped me get it up on, on streaming platforms. So at the moment, I mean, and that's the other consideration is, you know, I would want to be able to play shows and have like cassette tapes or vinyl there, uh, mm -hmm. or any kind of merch, you know, shirts or anything like that. It, it feels like, in order for me to, to feel comfortable selling that stuff to people, I should be putting myself out, you know, and I don't know if that's necessary, but that's kind of how my brain is thinking about it. You know? Well, I mean, you could take a page out of the book of like, you know, like Aaron, Aaron Turner, like he, mm. they, when they do an, uh, you know, a Sumac show, there's also other stuff from his other projects. So yeah. while you're on tour with Caven, you could have your, your vinyl and your shirt on mm. the merch table, you know, it wouldn't be. Yeah. The other guys in Caven do it. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's, it yeah. should be fine. Yeah, I, I just, it's like one set of, step at a time with this yeah. project, you know? No, nah, bro, uh, get on it, dude. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, you got to get shit done. Yeah, you know, we're living in a time people's uh, attention spans are so small, you know, like yeah. everything is instant and quick. And uh, mm. like, it feels wild to me that uh, like Heavy Pendulum came out. Like that was my album of the year, and like now it's like yeah. wow, it was already a year ago. Like what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I know it's crazy. The anniversary just came up on that. Yeah. Um, and we, uh, yeah, we put together a little, uh, some footage of you know, behind the scenes in the studio and stuff. And I'm like, man, that that seems like it was. It's weird because it kind of seems like it was just yesterday, but then it also feels like it was years and years ago. You know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's crazy how fast time moves these days for some weird reason. Maybe it's just because we're getting older, you know? Yeah. We're getting older. We're running out of it. We're running out of the amount of, of that, that we have. Uh, so we want to yeah. get more shit done, I guess. I don't know. That's how I feel lately anyway, mm. especially like after, after the lockdown and everything where we were kind of like, well, wait, what? There's nothing. Yeah. And then, yeah, I they... totally, uh, I feel that hundred percent because, you know, I, uh, I spent, you know, so you mentioned video games at the beginning yes. there, <clears throat> but I mean, I can honestly, you know, wholeheartedly say that for the, you know, my, all of my twenties into maybe like 
up to my mid thirties, I was addicted to video games, like straight up. Like it was like to the point where I would boot up games and just sit there and not even play the games and just stare at the screen. Cause I was so bored to tears with this stuff, but I couldn't help. But like, that's just what I did. I, you know, got home wow. from work and turned the video games on, even though it wasn't bringing me any satisfaction or pleasure, like classic symptoms of addiction, you know? Sure. Um, and kind of stopping that and, you know, it, what really helped was I'm going to beat around the bush a little bit here, but what really helped for me was that, um, I actually got the opportunity to stop working a full-time job and stay home with my two kids, um, and just deal with, you know, the whole, like getting them to school and the, you know, uh, you know, home dad sort of thing. And, uh, that gave me a lot of free time that I never had. I mean, I've been working my ass off since I was 14, you know? Yeah. Um, so I never really had that time to just, all right, what do you do now? So I ended up playing video games for like the first month or two, like just nonstop besides the times that I had to deal with, you know, my children's needs. Uh, yeah. and, uh, you know, I got to the point, I was like, I'm just kind of wasting this time. I could be doing something productive. And that's when I was like, oh yeah, I kind of remember, you know, being on tour in cave and. Uh, there was a stretch with Antenna that we were on tour for like two and a half years. And I remember getting uh, Reason, which is like the, it's like a DAW with a synthesizer built in and has sequencers and stuff. So, you know, I remember getting a copy of that, playing with it on the road, but I never took it really serious, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I was like, oh yeah, maybe I should kind of get into that, you know? I had a little bit of, of disposable income, bought a sampler and so started the whole process, you know? And now I feel like that that thing where I'm like, I'm trying to make up for, you know, 15 years of what I consider wasted time. You know? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I, I totally feel that like I'm just kind of I feel like I'm like, hurry up. You got so much more to do. But in the process of doing all this, I'm like, I have to take each step as it is, because it's still very overwhelming to for me to do it all on my own you know, cause I'm so yeah. used to working with other people. So. Yeah. 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 No, I can hear, I feel that man. I feel that I still am helplessly uh, addicted to video games. Yeah. So like, but I just, I choose no sleep. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I'm at. And you have kids. I don't have kids. I don't have to worry about that. I have yeah. dogs. I do have to take them for walks and stuff, but it's not the same. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. It's a little different, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, uh, I haven't, completely you know sworn off my video games but it's, I've, I, it's... my the reasoning that i use now is that i'm getting old and i need it so i don't get dementia yeah right yeah or it keeps Alzheimer's. the brain sharp it keeps yeah. me sharp i'll play like 10 minutes of tetris a day or something you know i'll, I'll yeah. pop in some like i don't know something that makes me use my brain and yeah, like, yeah all right i feel productive because you know I'm learning or something. Yeah. Or keeping myself Hand-eye sharp. coordination. No? Yeah, <laughs> training. It's training. That's what it yeah, is. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, if anything, it, it certainly helped me be a better driver. You know, all the quick reactions and stuff, you know? Yeah. I yeah mean, knock on true. wood, I've never been into a car accident. Now, look, what's going to happen? But uh, I don't believe so much in fate, so. Uh, but I've had, I've know. had a couple, I've had a couple. They're not fun. Yeah. No. <laughs> I've been in other car accidents, but just not while me at the wheel, you know? Mm, gotcha. Luckily. Uh, but I've had a few close calls and I always come away from being like, man, I, I just want to pin that on video games. You know, they helped me with that. You know, <laughs> a little bit of the left bumper e-brake. Yeah. You yeah. Know, get yourself moved. <laughs> yeah. And no, I get yeah. you. that. That makes Drifting, sense. Drifting all that stuff. Yeah. You know? I, it makes sense. I think it does help, you know, I, I I know that there's a part of it or certain games really where you're not really doing much. You're just sitting there like yeah. that, that's I get that. But there are certain games where, like, you know, you got to stay sharp. Like I've been playing what there's Super Meat Boy. It's like a little 2D scroller, but yeah, it's a platformer it. and it's mostly like it's almost rhythm based. But like you just kind of it's it's on rails. So you have to just mm. tap the jump button to avoid right. all the obstacles. And it just keeps me like on my toes like, oh, shit. Oh, shit. You, you got to be quick. Yeah. And that kind of feels like I use that not just in driving, but in other, like, even just social situations. Mm. Like, I, if I'm in a conversation or I'm out in public or something, I always feel like the t I get the timing of the of the conversation right because I'm, I'm, like, staying on top of it. I don't know. Mm. It's weird. I'm making excuses. I like video <laughs> games. Yeah, yeah. No, they're, they're fun. I mean, I, I've, I've been able to 
you know, turn it into a, a leisurely sport at this point. But it, there was a time where it just dominated my life. You know, yeah. I, I used to take a laptop on tour so I could hook up to the internet and play, you know, online games. Nice. So that's what type, how bad. And what, what type of games are we talking? What are we talking about? Uh, well, that one that I'm mentioning was one of the original MMOs. It was called Ashron's Call. Oh, um, wow. Okay. Like way back. Yeah. And so I think it came out in 98, 99, something like that. Nice. Um, but I like that was my world for uh, up until they closed the servers. I was still around, you know. Nice. Uh, but so that was the game that I, I really got heavily addicted to. And the game where I mentioned I would just stare at the screen, not knowing what to do, just knowing that I had to be in the game, you know, right. for no reason at all. <clears throat> but then. Uh, yeah, I mean, these days I. Uh, well, MMO this, makes a little more sense to me because you kind of yeah. it's social. Like uh, I've I've played you know I played uh, Final Fantasy fourteen which is an MMO, yep. and I know that there are people that just hang out there like they don't do mm. anything they don't they don't do any quests they don't go on any adventures yeah they just sign in and then talk to their friends it's like a chat room to them yeah it's their space it's, you it's, know it's, it's it's interesting I mean whatever yeah I I, I mean I, so like it. it it turned into that but then it slowly like that game. Uh, it was on live support for a very long time. Mm. And during that time, like all the friends that I had in the game had long since gone. And I was just, it, it was that habit for me, you know, and I would literally just sign into the game, not talk to anybody, not do anything, like just oh, kind of yeah. spin around and like run around in the game world, but not do anything with it, you know? Uh, and it, it, it was kind of, it was, you know, looking back on it, hindsight, it was kind of, you know, bleak, you know? Um, but well, I have all, very we, fond memories of it, you know. You have fun with it. We all do dumb shit that doesn't mean <laughs> anything, you know. It, yeah. For you, it was that. For somebody else, it was, you know, just I'm going to go sit on the rooftop of my house for four hours and stare at the sun. Like some people, you know, don't yeah. do anything. At least you were spinning around in a video game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's fine. We all do yeah. dumb shit. It's fine. I think yeah, uh, totally. don't don't try not to look at it as like wasted time. But it is, yeah. uh, you know, as we get older, it's important I, to kind of like do more shit, I think. Yeah, it definitely helped me with my, um, you know, social anxiety, especially being on the road. And I'm not comfortable in big crowds. I'm actually maybe more comfortable in big crowds just because I can kind of disappear in the crowd sort of thing, you know. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I have, a, I have a hard time with uh, with social interactions in general. Like I'm sweating my balls off right now, you know, just talking to you <laughs> and I'm not like nervous with you or anything, but it's just, I can't help it. You know, it's right, one of those right. things. So I think it, you know, it did serve somewhat of a purpose, especially when I was on the road, um, you know, but it is something that I wish that I had done a little bit less of and spent more time focused on other things, you know, sure. um, but you know, whatever, at least I'm doing it now, you know? For sure, for sure. And, I mean, the yeah. shows are getting bigger for you guys, too, as time progresses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bigger crowds. I mean, what's the biggest you've played in front of right now? Uh, I mean, it would certainly be something like in a festival. Um, I think, uh, what was that one? It's over in France. Uh, oh, Hellfest? Hellfest, yeah. I think that was the biggest in recent memory. That was probably 10,000. We're in that tent that we played, um, which was insane. I mean, it, it does – it like – I got up there and usually I'm nervous for shows, but I wasn't that nervous because it looked so surreal to see that many people in front of the stage. I was like, oh, whatever, <laughs> you know, like it, it doesn't make sense to me, you know? So no, your brain just stops thinking about it. Like, yeah. Nope, and eh. you just kind of do it, you know? <laughs> I was. It makes me think of like you know the the sporting events. You see these stadiums are like eighty thousand, ninety thousand people. Like, yeah. How the hell, man? How it's insanity. It makes I think me. The biggest, uh, yeah. Go ahead. The, the biggest show that Caven has ever played was, um, I think it was on Muse tour way, you know, a few years back. And that was, uh, I think it was also in France maybe. And that was like 15,000, something like that, 17, somewhere between there. And it was one of those moments where we came out, no one gave a shit about us, but when the lights go down in the room, everyone goes nuts, no matter what, you know? Right, right. And it was one of those things where I had to cover my ears because it was so loud. And then we get up there and it was like, well, we want to muse, you know, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but uh, that was that was a crazy experience. That's um, nuts, dude. Fifteen. Yeah, it's a lot of people. Yeah, I don't know. 
I mean, it was cool to have that experience and to say that I've done that, but I, I like the, the kind of the level that we're at now, you know, like, so the last show that we played uh, was also a festival. It was over at, uh, at uh, uh, Roadburn just recently. Mm. And I think that room was uh, three to 4,000 cap. Um, okay. So that's a pretty comfortable size as far as the big size rooms. Sure. But, you know, you can't be like a, you know, 300 capacity club, you know, three, 500 capacity. That's like the sweet spot, I think, you know. That's dope. Yeah, I like yeah. that. I, there's certain bands that don't even belong in like big stadiums. I just, when you hear, it doesn't sound the same. It right. It feel the same, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I hate, I've grown to hate festivals now. Like, I love looking at the lineups. The idea mm. is awesome. But yeah. then I start thinking about the logistics, like this big one that just happened in uh, Vegas, the sick new world that had all the all of mm. the new metal bands. And <laughs> I was like, my friends were like, come on, let's go. I'm like, it sounds like such a nightmare. There are yeah. band, band, I got to like run from one stage to the other. There's a, thousands of people in the crowd. Like, nah, I'm yeah. good. I'll watch it. And there's like time. apps to track all your progress through all the different stages and shit. Like, Fuck all like that, I, dude. I would never go to any of this stuff if I wasn't playing, <laughs> to be all honest, right. you know, uh, there's very few, uh, bands or, you know, artists that I would go see live just because I would want to go without playing, you know, um, very few. Uh, and even when I do get the chance to go to some of them, I'm kind of like, all right, I've seen half the set, like, I'm out, you know? Sure, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because I just can't take it, and you're standing up the whole time. And, you know, I, I, again, I don't like being around a lot of people like that, you know? Um, so, yeah, I, the only reason why I go to shows like that is because I'm playing, you know? True, true. Do you go to shows, like, smaller shows that, around town ever? Uh, not really. I can't say that I do. I mean, every once in a while, uh, someone will invite me out to, a you know, a little show. I would say little, but, you know, a small, you know, small local shows, wherever they may be. And I'll go, especially if I know the people playing. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I'm not I I'm totally out of the loop when it comes to, like, you know, knowing what's going on in town. And I mean, there Salem actually has um, a pretty good, you know, crew that, you know, they put on a lot of hardcore shows and a lot of punk rock shows. Um, and there's a couple different spots in town that that put these shows on and they do well, but I just, I never really hear about them cause I'm not kind of in those social circles, I guess. And I try not to use social media so much. So, uh, yeah, I never hear about shit unless actually someone from cave and lets me know, Hey, there's this show you want to go, you know? Nice. Um, so that's really the only way that I hear about live, you know, acts or whatever. I'm pretty, I, I like to stay home in my little, you know, little cave your cave and with and all then... my synths you know <laughs> now i wanted to ask you this is something that i've been asking people more often um do you give me a mount rushmore i want two different ones i want an electronic mount rushmore now that for 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 what you're doing now and uh yeah. let me get a, a heavy rock you know slash metal mount rushmore for you as well all right uh hmm. all right so how many heads are on the Mount Rushmore? We got four. There's four. All right. God. Um, so I guess, so the electronic thing, just because it's kind of been more recent in my world. Well, I mean, the problem with the rock Mount Rushmore is that there's so much stuff yeah. that I've come up on that, you know, it's hard to pick and choose, but we'll get there. We'll put uh, you, well, well, let's do it in the, the genre that is Caven. In Caven. Uh, so... Definitely. Well, a lot of it goes. Well, all right. So, can I do like four heads? Is like four different bands. Can I yeah, do yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all right, fine. cool. Uh, so that's allowed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first one, I guess, the first one that comes to mind in Cave and would be uh, Sunny Day Real Estate. Um, they were uh, they were a big influence, especially the drummer on the way that I play drums, uh, and it's even more so. Uh, when I thought about it in recent years, going back to uh, listening to some of those records, it's like, man, I ripped this fucker off, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, I kind of feel bad, but, you know, he still does his own thing. But I definitely, I can tell that a lot of my, my style comes from, you know, growing up on him. Um, 
so there's sunny day real estate is one um so cave and especially uh i'd say so you know i have to mention these and this would go on any kind of rock rush mount you know mount rushmore for me would be uh you know um sound garden is definitely up there you know that maybe all of those bands into one head so sound garden alice in chains uh you know um Temple of the Siamese Dog. Dream from Pumpkins, you know, like, hey, I, I can't, I like Temple of the Dog when it came out, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I can't listen to it nowadays, but you know, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, all that stuff was huge in our world for sure. Okay. Um, so, and then you know, I'd have to mention, of course, Bonham, um, and Led Zeppelin, you know, by sure. proxy, but uh, so that's three, I guess. So the fourth, I'll say, you know what, uh. A big one for me, which is actually a little in a weird way that I can explain is a little bit of a crossover into the electronic realm, but that would be Meshuggah. Oh. Um, so, yeah, Thomas Haka or Haka, or I, I'm sorry if I'm butchering his name, but <laughs> he is an amazing drummer. And yeah. that band as a whole have done some wild shit uh, with their music. And the way that it transitions into electronic music, or at least for me with how I approach it is because they're open about this fact as well, but some of their records have been kind of, from what I understand, programmed and written before they actually get in a room and play together, right, which is right. really interesting. I, I kind of like the idea of changing the way people write music these days, because there, it's, there's no reason to limit yourself to, you know, writing and recording in one way, at least in my opinion, there are some purists out there, you know, um, sure. which I'm not going to fault them if that's what they're, they're looking for, you know, but for me, I, I think it's interesting when people have very different ways of, you know, thinking about how to record and write music. Um, and Mashuga is one of those bands that just seem like they're trying different things and, you know, going back and forth between what works, what they found works and what doesn't, you know, um, and so, you know, a lot of that programming side kind of made me feel comfortable with programming drums on the Marlis stuff, because that stuff is programmed drums. It's not, I, in a way, I can say that they're played live, but it's only after the fact. So all the drum sounds on that record, on the Marlis record, are all, um, their samples taken from the drum sound from Heavy Pendulum, actually. Ah, so there's a connection there too. So I was able to um, spend, you know, a couple minutes just making samples with Kurt in the studio with nothing else going on. And then uh, he was gracious enough to let me do that. So then I took those samples home and I use an MPC to cut everything up and, and um, you know, get my drum samples that way. And that way I was really able to, use the samples in the MPC to kind of play around with different things. And the way that I find that I experiment with drums and drum patterns is very different. And I come up with different ideas rather than me sitting at a kit, you know, um, I'm very reactionary on the kit. Like they, like I'm always in a band when I'm playing actual acoustic drums and it's always me playing to, you know, a riff that someone's brought to the table, you know, um, gotcha. And there's very few times where I'm like, I got this drum beat. Let's write a song around it, you know. Um, so the way that I approach drumming, uh, actually physically drumming, is is very much a reactionary process. Gotcha. Um, so with the Marlis stuff, it, it kind of allowed me to start with the drums first and come up with what I thought was interesting patterns. And, um, and because I'm doing everything with my hands, it's very easy to do just different shit that I wouldn't think of if I'm using all four limbs, you know? Sure. Um, so it's a different process and it, it just kind of tweaks it a little bit so I can think about it differently, you know? Yeah. Did um, you do a lot of, uh, did you do a lot of like table drumming when you were in school, like when you were younger with your hands? And yeah. Stuff? So that's awesome that you bring that up because <laughs> that was another thing I was like trying to figure out how I was going to do drums for this project. And I came along with the MPC. Originally, I had other samplers cutting up my drum sounds. 
Um, but this one, because of the pads and that the way that they've been able to implement, you know, velocity and, and just the dynamics that you could play, it felt like I was doing what I was doing in high school on my tet on my desk, you know, and I would totally just tap my fingers on the desk all day long and drive my teachers nuts, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I definitely, that thought specifically came to mind as well when I got the MPC and I was starting to play around with, you know, triggering drum sounds with the MPC pads and it was like, Oh yeah, I feel like I'm a kid. And I was like, that's great because that's what I want to do when I'm writing music on my own. I want to feel like I'm a kid, you know? For sure, uh, for sure. So yeah, that, that's definitely there. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Well, you have uh, the Mount Rushmore of electronic music to give me. Mm. You gave me the rock. So yeah, I, I transitioned <laughs> to that. Uh, uh, so number one, I think a constant source of inspiration is actually a, a an artist. Uh, he does mostly techno. He's known as a techno artist, although he does some um, sound on sound stuff. And his uh, moniker or stage name, if you will, is Surgeon. Um, and I think his uh, real name is uh, Anthony Childs. Uh, but he's UK based. And actually, uh, knowledge of him kind of ties into our world as well, because he's, uh, he's originally from Birmingham. Uh, and he, I don't remember. So, but he either went to school with, or he hung out with a lot. Um, uh, the name is es escaping me, but God flesh dude, uh, oh, okay. and Yezu, uh, yeah. man, I wish I could remember his name right now. Uh, uh, Broderick, Justin Broderick. There it is. So they, they are kind of bros if my understanding is correct, you know? Um, uh, so that's an interesting tie into our world. Uh, but he more so the way that he looks at music and um, kind of creating music is more of my inspiration than his music. Although I do love his music. Okay. Uh, he just put out a record that I, I can't stop listening to, but um, I got really into his approach of doing things, uh, especially how he does it live. He, he does a lot of with uh, improvis improv improv i can't say that whole improvisation. word improvisation <laughs> improvisation yeah. there we go god uh <laughs> but yeah so that um he is really open about how he's just he flows with things and allows things to happen um and he kind of works with the machines that he's ha that he has at his disposal and just the way he goes about thinking about music and and you know that whole thing really kind of fascinated me because I never really got into it. I mean, prior to that, you know, the idea of improv to me was uh, very jazz related, you know, yeah, jazz, um, Spanish jazz, that whole world, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which I do, you know, and like jam bands, which, you know, I, I you know, I have a low opinion of most jam bands. <laughs> there are some amazing musicians, yeah, yeah. but I can't, go to you know a show that's just like a bunch of jam bands you know because yeah, most of them have, sorry all, but they suck you, you know? gotta have a lot of mushrooms and uh <laughs> those are expensive you know yeah maybe that's the key <laughs> right uh yeah so you know as far as especially with electronic music like just hearing someone saying that they rely on improv for electronic based music especially techno which is you know so programming my and rigid and it's like yeah, yeah super sequenced, sequenced out stuff you know um, so it, it was really interesting and really eye opening to hear him talk. I mean, I went through a deep rabbit hole, you know, listening to podcasts and interviews with him. Um, so he is definitely like right at the, the front of that mountain, you know. All right. All right. Um, but just behind him, I, I guess it would be, you know, um, I mean, I hate to say the classics, but they're there for a reason. I would lump those in like the, uh, the grunge genre, but, you know, Nine Inch Nails and Ministry. Um, and also some of the, so I can't say that I'm a big fan or listen a lot to some of the early, uh, like, you know, late, late seventies, early eighties kind of before new it, like, you know, like front 242 and, and, uh, uh, like Bauhaus was there and like all those bands, you know, uh, skinny puppy, all that stuff. Um, you know, that stuff was really, uh, it's really interesting to me mm -hmm. and I like the idea of it more than I actually like listening to it, you know, if that makes sense. 
So, and I think it's kind of what I got a lot from that stuff was um, just the vibe of it. You know, it's like really dark, you know, in that moment of time, it not, you know, video that you see isn't clear because it's old technology, you know, it's not like super definite, high definition stuff. Yeah. So it has a sort of feel to it. It's like when people say, oh, I like listening and recording stuff to tape, you know, it's like yeah. that same deal, you know. Um, so that that definitely carried over into what I was trying to listen for and what I was trying to do with Marlith because just that kind of gritty vibe to everything you know and it's dark sure. and it, it it has this kind of um for, foreboding presence in the background you know yeah um so it's heavy it, it's heavy i like that yeah yeah uh i and you know so and that a lot a lot of that comes from ministry more so than nine inch nails but i think that's just because in my adult life i like listening to select ministry things not all of it is great in my opinion but um yeah, so I guess I flip flop between Nine Inch Nails and Ministry if I'm thinking of that era of music, you know. And I mean, they, both bands do, you know, they continue to do interesting stuff. I like the last Ministry album. Uh, I still think Trent and Nine Inch Nails do interesting things, even outside of Nine Inch Nails. Um, so you know, I can't can't bag on them, and they're definitely up there. I mean, they the influence in my music history is undeniable you know yeah um so it would be wrong for me to try and like pretend like oh no I, that's that has no effect on me you know yeah um, it's Trent's does, definitely so. up there for me in my list if you yeah. know if i were making one because that kind of same idea with, with the 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 first dude you mentioned the the his process is what yeah. really attracted me to nine inch nails like uh just exploring sounds and creating sounds and like the way he pr produces everything really, really was well. then there was that. And also the fact that it was pretty much the first uh, music I bought mm. <laughs> when I was yep. a kid. Yeah. I went to the store. I finally had money. I was like, what do I get? And I got pretty hate machine on cassette. That yeah. was the first thing I ever bought. So, <laughs> and then you get home and you're like, what the fuck is this? You know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> And even like every once in a while, I'll still put, you know, that on and, and just it's it's crazy to me that that would come out at that time. Yeah. And it still resonates with me, I guess, you know. Yeah. Um, and it, it's so I thank you for saying that, because that reminded me that um, when I was doing this stuff, uh, I was also watching a lot of videos and because I was trying to come up with a process of how to write music, you know, using this this uh this equipment and stuff and so i was watching and so one of the things um was that uh i know in recent years and that you know i can't go in depth about his process because i only know what i see on youtube you know um but you know as far as nine inch nails um he has atticus ross with him and he goes in and you know they just hit record and he plays a bunch of stuff on whatever instruments that he's using at the moment, what he feels, you know, and he does all these long kind of jams essentially. And then he'll leave the room or they take a break and Atticus Ross kind of comes in and edits the whole thing mm -hmm. and pieces things together. And I was like, man, that's such a great idea to do that. And I was like, I have a sampler. I have the means of doing that. And I was actually, I was doing a lot with exploring drones and ambient stuff and, long noise jams and just hitting record and just doing it so you can kind of forget that you're recording and trying to make something and just enjoy the process you know and then i was like oh and then he's going back and cutting that stuff up and that's also something that i i read um about um the uh, al jorgensen's process and their kind of idea about doing things too at whatever moment they were using this this process but they would go in and bulk record so they would go in record tons and tons of shit just get it down on in a recording and then go back and piece things up cut everything up you know and that that's their process so it's like all right i'm just gonna rip this you know that's kind of the same process i'm just gonna take that and run with it and that's that's basically how a lot of the marvelous stuff got written um was just from jams that i cut up and then put riffs over top of you know yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean that, so to what you were saying, that's, uh, that played a lot into how I was doing this stuff. Um, so yeah, man, that's only two heads. <laughs> <laughs> two more, uh, two more.
Yeah, damn. All right. Uh, oh, I can't think of any right now. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, so let me. So you can edit this shit if you need to. But let me look at look at my uh, my playlist here because I, I I mean a lot of it's um, I look for processes more than music, especially with this stuff. I mean, Aphex Twin, I guess, would be the third head. Absolutely. Um, I just I, I saw it. Yeah, there's a couple uh, playlists in my phone there. Um, but yeah, I mean, listening to that stuff, it's always been far out. And I tried for a little for a minute to kind of emulate his style, you know, a lot of the glitchy stuff and, you know, overlaying uh, glitchy drum patterns and stuff, you know, with a lot of ambient background. Oh, I got my fourth guy, too. Um, but so that uh, I really tried to emulate that, but I couldn't hang with trying to get the vibe and i was like i'm just trying to be someone else you know right 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 um so but that i mean even from actually the late 90s i got into him you know with all of the stuff that he he released on warp records you know and you know that that definitely plays a part into how i view electronic music so yeah i guess he would be the third head um it's a pretty cool question this this question you got here uh <laughs> Yeah, so the fourth one, I mean, and it, I mean, I guess it could actually go into the rock arena as well, but not so much. But it would be um, Brian Eno. Wow. I mean, I, you know, I'm citing a lot of influences that a lot of people cite, but I think it's because they're really important, uh, yeah. especially for certain genres of music, you know. And with Brian Eno, I mean, it, it's definitely a lot about again, his process on how he does his different records. And he seems to change the way he approaches writing music with each project. Um, and I really, I really enjoyed my time kind of in research with him, you know, and then listening to all his recordings through the years. I mean, it's cool. Some of the stuff he's pulled off and going back and listen and, and kind of reading uh, as well as listening to like early records. I mean, a lot of the stuff was done on eight tracks and four tracks and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, wow, he's he's really creating special things with not a whole lot of, you know, gear or money invested or anything like that. He's just using what he's got on hand and making something cool with it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he's definitely up there, too. Um, and a lot of the, you know, ambient things that I've done, of course, like he's kind of the godfather of ambient, you know. Yeah. Um, so I guess those would be on the rush mount, you know, the Mount Rushmore, uh, mountain there, but that's a good, that's know. a good mountain. That's a good Mount Rushmore. You gave me two, yeah. which is more than I normally ask people. Yeah. So you're good. <laughs> well, there you got a two for, uh, awesome brother. Well, Hey, I, I appreciate you taking time to sit with me today and talk about the album. Let, let me, let me hear, like, give a, give the people the one minute pitch on, on Marlith. Oh, jeez. See, so you're catching me here. This is stuff that I, I don't know how to answer. Got to get you but ready for the big That's time. good, though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I wanted to see what I could do on my own. Um, I'm certainly not. Uh, I'm not expecting to ever stop playing music with other people. Uh, and I'm not planning on ending my drumming career anytime soon. But as far as Marlith in particular, it's definitely is something that I wanted to kind of experiment using different gear that I normally would or that I have in the past. I've always had an interest in synthesizers, so I wanted to incorporate those. And then I was like, I'm just going to go full in. And the drum sample, I did have a moment where I was like, am I doing the right thing with the drums, you know, sampling them and sequencing them. But a lot of them I'm playing by hand, albeit through a sampler instead of a real drum set. But it's just really an exploration on my part. And I'm putting it out there because I know that people like, you know, things like ministry and this, you know, a lot of heavy electronic music. And it's coming, you know, it, it's more prevalent these days in our, you know, heavy music world, you know, with bands like Author and Punisher and, and you know, ministry still doing their thing. And there's plenty of others that I would never be able to remember their names of until 3 a.m. this morning, you know? <laughs> three um, teeth. How about that? I'll give you three teeth. Yeah. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> um, so, uh, and like, uh, uh, MP Bird and 
I think is his name. I can't, he's a, uh, he does uniform in New York. Uh, I think it's uniform. Yeah. See, and now I feel bad if I say the wrong name, you know, that's why I try not to call out names too much. Cause I'm always wrong. Uh, the guys in cave, will tell you that, but that's a longer minute pitch and it's not really pitch. It's just, yeah, my, my idea with the whole thing is mostly just an exploration using this gear that has always fascinated me and doing it in such a way that would make sense for me. And that would make sense for, you know, maybe some of the people who know who I am and expect maybe a certain thing, but I'm trying to just play with stuff in a different way than normal, I guess. And it helps me do it at home where I don't have to travel to a practice space and I can do it at, at you know, late at night, you know? So I don't know. It's just, it's fun. Nice. I just try and have fun with it, you know? Hell yeah! I, obviously, I don't think about it too much. <laughs> <laughs> you did play around with electronics a little bit um, when you guys with Caven when you did the, that cover of uh, Moore. Yeah, I saw uh, so, a video. Yeah. Yep, uh, and that's kind of the same rig that I have. I mean, I still use a lot of that gear to do this uh, Marlis stuff, and so I guess on Heavy Pendulum too. There's um, there is a lot of me messing around with my synthesizers and those guys were good enough to let me do it you know um but so yeah there's a lot of moments you know uh thrown into that record that it's a lot of my synthing if you will mm -hmm. so yeah it's it's been around for a little while but this is the first real kind of focused effort on something so yeah, it's good that people know that because that you know it's not like out of nowhere you've been you've been teasing yeah. it, you know. Yeah. Uh, in terms of Cave In, I know it's only been a year since Heavy Pendulum, and you guys are still actively touring on it. But mm -hmm. uh, have there been talks of more? Is this you know because for a time there we all we you know it's uh, we all know that there was no you know it wasn't going to happen. Uh, but then all of a sudden it started yeah. happening and and then more happened. So, I mean, should we expect yeah. more? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, at this point, I mean, we're, we're um, comfortable and committed to, you know, continuing on as a band and, and continuing playing and writing. Um, so yeah, it's, we've decided to keep going because it, it kind of feels like the right thing to do versus stopping, um, you know, and it's, it's mostly, I mean, there's a lot of it has to do with kind of keeping, you know, the legacy of Caleb going. Um, there is definitely that, but it's also, we found that we just still really like playing music together. Um, and a lot of the times we come together and we make the best music that we make together. So there's no real point in starting anything new or stopping what we have, you know, it's why not just keep it going, you know, and, and keep the memory alive and keep, you know, the whole history of the band continuing to go on, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, so, you know, in the future right now, we're still touring, um, still playing shows and stuff such for heavy pendulum, especially. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think there, there will definitely be a, a moment where we get back into the, into the room and, and write more stuff. I mean, Steve has already sent out, you know, three or four demos that, um, uh, you know, have just been kind of listened to and like, yeah, put that in the, in the uh, folder for later, you know, so we can come back to it, you know? And I think that's going to happen no matter what, because, you know, we all kind of continuously write music on our own and kind of come up with ideas and, you know, it's hard for us not to share it with each other. Um, so that's, you know, that's something that we'll always do, I think, until we physically can't do it anymore. So I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it because, you know, Heavy Pendulum was one of those things where, you know, before it, it was Final Transmission and, and we weren't like there was still, you know, songs from Caleb there. Like this was like the first new album with with Nathan and or Nate, Nathan. My God, what am I? His dad. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Nathan. With, with, with Nathan uh, no, he put a, you know, the album yeah. came out great. It was like I said, my album of the year. Like mm, I, thank uh, you th that album. So I'm um, excited to hear more of it. Hopefully, and maybe more electronics are infused in there for you. You know, um, and also just I'm yeah. There's talk. I, Go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just wanted to you know say um, that the idea to add more electronics into Caven uh, is definitely a thought, but it's not something that we've really worked out um, 
more than what's on Heavy Pendulum. Uh, more is kind of like uh, accents and, you know, between song ambient pieces and stuff like that. Um, we've definitely played along uh, around with the idea of adding stuff in a more kind of structural way to the what we do in Caven, but I honestly don't know how to approach that. Um, and I think it's something that we'll have to kind of suss out and figure out as we do it, you know, sure. um, especially because like I'm playing drums, so it's hard to play keys. It's hard to, you know, mess around with knobs and switches and stuff. So it's really something that I'm going to have to be able to trigger with a drum pad or something like that, or samples that we bring in or oh. well, a moment in the song, out, a but... moment in the song where there are no, there are no live drums. It's just, yeah. you, know, you, you turn around and do stuff, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely uh, under consideration, but we have yet to mess with it, really, you know? Well, I'm excited, man. It seems like uh, all good things to me. More Caven, you know, uh, Mar Marlith, potential shows maybe, or, you know. And, we'll see. And see. We'll see what happens there, but there's a lot to be excited about, and I want to thank you for taking time to talk to me about it. Please. Yeah, totally, man. I appreciate it, man. It, it's, uh, it's really nice having people be interested in what I'm doing. And I really, I, I definitely don't take that for granted. Um, and it's the reason why I play shows, even though I don't feel comfortable doing so. But, uh, you know, I really appreciate it. And especially at this point in my life, I, I, it's, it's nice to have people enjoy what I'm a part of. So I, I, you know, thank you for you and everyone else that enjoys the stuff. I mean, you know, there's not much else that I can say. <laughs> Well, make sure everybody that's watching and listening to go check out the album. It's out now on Bandcamp, right? Uh, the link yep. itself. Let me see. I have it here. Bandcamp. Sorry. I had your, your link tree. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. Marlith, M-A-R-I-L-I-T-H dot Bandcamp dot com. Go check it out. Yep. Also, follow them on social media. It's at underscore Marlith underscore. underscore. Yeah. So it's underscore beginning and end, yeah. Yes, awesome. Because there's uh, a couple other people out there with Marlith as their actual name, I guess. But oh, So well, not to be confused. Not to be confused. <laughs> yeah. Go check it all out. Also follow Caven, at Caven underscore yeah. in, or at Cave underscore in underscore Boston. If you haven't heard Heavy Pendulum, it was my album of the year last year. Go listen to it. I don't know what you're waiting for. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, JR, thanks again, man. I appreciate you. Yeah, you too, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll talk soon. All right, have a good one. Cheers.